All right, so every time I'm doing something in Haskell and I'm calling a function f and it may or may not have parameters, what will happen? What will happen on the left-hand side? I will have some result, right? So functions in Haskell, they always produce something. You, you don't have functions in Haskell that avoid, that do nothing. They always do something, right? So even if the if the function does nothing, like let, let's say f really does nothing, then what probably happens is I will probably get like this as a, a result, right? Um, so a lot of functions which do nothing, like uh, for example, um, put string line, right? What is put string line returning? It, it, it returns IO empty tuple, right? So it kind of returns nothing, but it's not really nothing. It's like this IO empty tuple, right? So every time I'm calling something on the left-hand side, something happens. And if I'm doing it in the context of the do, then a compiler is like checking what is that I'm returning such that it is kind of living in the context of the do monad which I'm doing stuff. We will come back to it in a moment. So normally the compiler complains if you don't use the value which is returned or if the value that is returned doesn't fit into the uh, monadic type of the do block, right? So inside the do block, if you're calling something and you don't using the result, you kind of don't care, then you usually have to say like this. You have to say, I actually don't care about what F returns, right? I'm assigning it to this underscore, but that means I don't care, right? And you have to tell it to the compiler. So normally you do this and the more fancy way of saying the same thing. So saying, I don't care what F returns because I really want the re return out of do block what G does, right? Uh, is like this. So the equivalent is you can you can do it the same way, um, but you say void and f and then g, right? It's those two those two code snippets are exactly the same, right? Void basically says I will take whatever the f returns and I will magically eat it up and I will and, and the compiler will be happy, right? Um, because I will convert it to whatever the, the actual monadic thing is out, out there and it will be okay. Uh, this does the same thing. It says, give me what F returns. Uh, is it underscore? No, it's minus. This needs to be underscore. Yeah. Uh, and then I don't care. So this is the, you know, the void thing, uh, which we are using here. So the alternative would be to say underscore and from iterate, you return into the void what the iterate returns, right? And iterate usually returns uh, an empty tuple anyway, so you don't care. Um, so should you use those two? No, don't don't use them. Just uh, just do this if you have to and use the normal normal looping like, like I did here. Um, Okay, so let's uh, let's do this do block thing, right? So if we go, um, yeah, you have to quit that. Uh, okay, so I prepared, I prepared a placeholder which is called. basics it's called basics so i i did start new basics right and then i have a new project no 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 don't create it and then i can edit source cd basics source no oh, come on okay so before i show you that let's see what app main looks like so main looks like uh, main calls some function, okay? So main calls some func, okay? And then we just uh, edit the some func. So some func, uh, okay, let's do it after. 
let's do it after. But first, let's do some funk with the printing of the name or getting the name, right? So some funk, like if we go back to the lab one, we're asking a user for a name and then we were printing hello name, right? Uh, so how would you do that? How would you define some funk? Some func doesn't take any parameters, right? Because it will be interacting with the users. It returns the IO monad, so it works within the IO monad context. And we have to do two things. So normally we implement it like this. We say do, uh, we say name, get me the name from get line. And then we would say put string line and say hello, concatenated with the name. Correct? Very simple, very hello wordish uh, Haskell. Uh, we probably have to do this uh, because we want to do this before it's passed to the put string line as a parameter. You could enclose that in, in uh, round brackets as well. So let's let's do this. Stack run. It compiles without any issues. It stops, it asks me for the name. We didn't prompt the user, so I, I say Marius, and then it says, hello, Marius, right? Perfect, so it does what it's supposed to do, and how does it do it? Well, there is this magic do keyword, right? The magic do keyword is a syntactic sugar for working with monadic structures. What is the monadic structure here? Is the IO monad, right? So IO is one of the big kind of a monadic structures that we work in Haskell with. And if we doing some, some things with IO, we have to kind of use functions which either consume or produce something to do with IO. So if we look into the, so let, let me quit that. Oh, stuck. So if I ask, what is the type of uh, get line? It says get line doesn't take any arguments and produces IO string. So get line doesn't give me a string. It gives me a string which is wrapped inside the IO monad, right? So it's not a normal string, it's a string inside the IO. Okay, so what put string line does? Well, put string line expects a string and it does some side effects and it returns nothing. It returns empty IO monadic state, right? So if I if I get name from get line, right? So name uh, is get line. And if I, no, I, I cannot really do that like this here. Um, so let's say let name equals get line. No, I cannot do that. Anyway, so if I have name, which is IO uh, Marius. Uh, So return Marius and it is IO string. Let's try that. Oh, come on, collaborate with me. I think it's already defined. Yeah, it might be. So let's say name two. Right, so what is name two? Name two is IO string. So that's what we're gonna get after we call get line, right? So when we call get line, we're gonna get IO string, which is name two. So now if I have name two, can I put string line name two? No, I cannot, right? Why? Because put string line expects a string and name two is a IO string. The types don't match, right? So how can I, print my name, which is IO string into the sc screen. Well, we kind of need to do a trick, right? So again, if we if you look into name two, it's an IO string, 
And if we look into put string line, it is a string argument, right? So it takes something without the context and then it uh, does something with it. It produces the something inside the context, right? So we kind of know, um, we know uh, a, a, a function which can do uh, something like that, right? So if I ask, um, if I ask about this, you will see that it is, if I ask about bind, bind takes a value in the, in the structure, which is our name two. Name two is a value inside the structure. And then it takes a function, which takes a plain value and produces a new value of new type in the same structure, right? So using bind, we can actually combine name two with put string line, and it will compose because of the signatures, the signatures will match, right? So the bind takes value in the structure and the function which converts a pure, like a, not pure, like a, um, a clean value into the value in the structure and then produces the new, new value in the structure. So our original A is a string. Our function is converting a string to an empty tuple. So A is a string and B is a tuple, empty tuple to be precise, and it will produce an empty tuple, right? So if I do this, it will work, right? It Like I can pass now my uh, um, name into the put string line and it will work. So if we quit that and if we go back here, uh, what we can do is we can basically rewrite this. So this, this works, we, we've tested it, but we can rewrite it into get line and then it's bind to put string line, uh, which prints, uh, which prints um, hello concatenated with uh, whatever is passed, right? So, so if, if, if we do the, the simple, let's do the simple case first. If we do this, right? Um, what will happen is get, get line will return us a IO string, which is a string inside the IO structure. And then we will bind it to a function which expects just string and it will produce the um, you know empty tuple with, within the IO construct. So if we kind of uh, convert this, so this, so this is our version one. So our version one is, do uh, get me a name from get line and put string line name, right? So this is an equivalent of this. So this line, this line gets line, which is IO, IO string and extracts the name, extracts the string out of this context, right? So somehow we unwrap whatever the structure was and give the pure string. Name is a pure string. And then this pure string, normal string can be passed as a parameter to put string line. And then we can call this, right? Um, and then it, it works. So this is exactly the same as this. Um, so do, what do is, do is a block which allows you to sequentially say what you want to unwrap and what you want to pass into from function to function the same way as you can do this uh, with, with this uh, bind operator, right? So it's kind of a syntax shortcut or syntax kind of a beautifier for doing this type of transformations, right? Um, and then if we were to do something more fancy, like if we were to say, uh, let, um, hello equals name concatenated or hello 
hello concatenated with name, right? And we printing hello, then we need to do this extra function on top of the name, right? So we need to uh, prefix name with this with this thing. So what we can do is we can uh, compose our put string line with the uh, concatenation function. So we need a carry. Uh, so in our case, we need a carry which says hello plus plus, and then this is a carry, right? Because uh, concatenate needs two arguments and we only gave it the left argument, right? So it still waits for the right argument to finish. Like it, it, it is a carry. Uh, and then this carry is uh, composed with put string line and put string line kind of will use that as a, as a uh, return value, right? So let's uh, stack run. And it again asks, like it doesn't actually prompt me, but I can say Marius, and then it says, hello, Marius, right? So again, you see this is exactly the same as this. So which one, which style is better? Which, how, how should you write Haskell? Well, for very simple things, like I would say, if you have actually a case like this, which is really simple, then this one requires four lines of code. Uh, and it is more verbose, but it doesn't really read much, much easier than this. Like this one is pretty obvious. One, once you get used to the bind and once you get used to the uh, um, you know, uh, composing functions. So I would say, yes, okay, you can, you can use this. You can use um, do for very simple things as well. But if the case is really simple, if it's just one use of bind and maybe one composition of functions, then maybe you don't need a do block. But if this line gets more complicated, if you actually need to do multiple things, if you need to pass things kind of uh, uh, in a more complex way, then this line will become kind of harder to process, harder to read. So then use the do block, right? So the do blog will be kind of a more verbose and more easy to follow what is actually happening and where the parameters are getting from, right? Um, so this arrow, left arrow, unwraps something from the monadic context into a value, right? Can you do that for other monadic structures other than IO? Of course you can. So the do is not limited to IO. Do can is a kind of a monadic uh, syntactic sugar thing that works for different functions. So if we define, um, if we define like uh, our add function, and our add function will take, uh, let's say it takes maybe int and produces a new maybe int, right? So we have um, an adder which um, expects a number and produces a number. And then we can say do, and when we do that, what we can do is we can say then that the number is taken from n. So n is the maybe int, and we can extract the actual int out of the maybe, right? And then what we can do is we can say return n plus 10 or 20, right? So then if I... Uh, yeah, so not return. What should I say here? Just, right? Yeah, let's see. No, I should like return is converting it to something that the, yeah, let me see what the compiler will say. So the compiler complains about N. Um, So, so it's, yeah, right, 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 right. We did a typo. 
So the typo is <laughs> both should work fine. The typo was we were using n, not num, right? Uh, so just works, but return should work also. So the, there is a, a, a small difference. Uh, like when I say just, I'm kind of doing it manually converting this number into the maybe int type because I know it's a just uh, number. But if I say return, is the return will do it like it, it will have like additional indirection, like return will check what monad are we in? Oh, we are in a maybe monad. So what is just, uh, what, what is the return implemented in like? It's implemented to return just that value, right? So it's like one function calling another function, right? Uh, but for, for um, like for being generic, you probably could return a return. But if you want to be kind of uh, specific, you can just say just. But I will keep return. So now if I write it and uh, run it, it will says, yeah, um, yeah, Marius, whatever. I want to do GHCI. So if I say, what is the type of our ad? Our, um, uh we didn't load them yes we didn't load the lip oh yeah because we're not exporting it so that is the problem the problem is that we don't export it and it's not visible so what's the type of our ad the type is maybe int into maybe int and then I can say our at just who, and it says twenty two, just twenty two, right? And we kind of did that by um, by extracting an actual integer out of our maybe integer and doing some operations on, on that normal integer right otherwise n is a maybe integer and then as you've saw, as you've seen with our typo if i try to do n plus 20 of course it's not gonna work because n is a maybe int so we cannot add 20 to a maybe int right so you kind of getting the intuition and then the do is just a syntactic construct for working within a particular monad and then by the left arrow we can extract value out of that monad, the actual value. In, in Rust, you basically say dot and unwrap, right? So in Rust, we're doing that all the time. We're doing all the time this left arrow because we're passing the state around. It's more imperative kind of programming. And we're saying dot unwrap. So if we have result or if we have some sort of error or option and you need to get the value out of this, you say dot unwrap or dot accept, right? Uh, expect. So then it kind of returns you the value and then throws an error if the value cannot be extracted. But we're breaking the kind of a composition. In Haskell, you cannot do that. In Haskell, if I have a maybe int, I cannot normally get this int outside of that, of that structure, right? Uh, I can kind of through pattern matching, but I cannot normally work with it unless you're doing this kind of a do block. Okay, so this is the code, it works. So what happens if this line fails? So what happens if, because you know, uh, our at handles maybe ints. What maybe int can be? Maybe int can be just integer or it can be nothing. So what happens if it's nothing and this line doesn't work? Let's try it out. So, if we do stack GHCI and we say our add nothing, what's gonna happen? What do you expect? That's one option or crash, yeah. So, we know that Haskell is doing all of that, all of that to prevent the second thing, right? So in, in C or C++ or a normal imperative programming, if we do something that is kind of a problematic, 
we probably will have a crash or we will have an exception or we'll have some error, right? But in Haskell, because of the purity of the functions, that is unacceptable. Like the functions cannot crash. Like a function given the same arguments always produces the same result. So the function has to always work, right? It's like a complete. So that means nothing will happen. So it will return nothing, right? So it will not crash. So most of the time when there is some sort of erroneous situation, you can expect Haskell to handle it nicely, right? But it's not always the case. There are situations where Haskell will tell you, you're doing something really stupid, I'm gonna crash your program such that you fix your programming errors, right? Mm -hmm. One of those things is, for example, if you say, give me a head on a, of an empty list, right? What's gonna happen now? What would you expect? Well, if, if, you, if there is a function head and it returns a value out of the list, it has to work, right? It cannot not work. So what would be a function returning a, a head of an empty list return? Haskell doesn't know. Like you're doing something really stupid, right? You're doing something really wrong. So it, it's going to crash. It's going to say, ah, oh, man, you know, you cannot do that to me. I don't know what to return to you, right? Um, because an empty list can is a polymorphic. It has multiple different types. And then uh, you have to return the head and there is no head. So it cannot do it, right? So there are situations where Haskell will actually throw an exception or division by zero or returning head of an empty list or things like that. But most of the time, like if, if you're doing, um, if you defined your maybe type and you're doing things with, with maybe, then usually if one of the things becomes nothing, then at the end you just have nothing, right? Um, so this is kind of nice. Uh, why it is nice? Because you can compose. So if I have just, you know, if I have just 10, I can, um, I can compose it so I can pass it to, um, to my function, right? So I can, let, let's, let's do something simpler. So I can do our add with just 10, right? And this one will return a maybe type. So here I have a maybe type and our add returns a maybe type. So I can compose it further and I can um, pass this value to a, a new add, right? So our add, I can do that. And I can keep doing that. Right, I can compose I, I'm, I'm first doing this. I'm adding, uh, what are we adding? 20, I think. We're adding 20 to 10, then we're adding 20 to the result of that, and we're adding 20 to the result of that, right? It kind of works. So, and we get 70 at the end, right? And you can see that doing this, uh, I can kind of do it for a long chain. Like, let's say I'm kind of uh, doing it for a long chain of expressions, yeah? So I've always, I've been wondering, like what's what's I've seen you use the dots to compose functions before yeah. and I've seen you use the star signs, but what's the main difference? Why can I use sometimes use a dot and sometimes not? Good good question. Can I use dot here? Can I substitute my dollar sign with dots? Okay, it's a complicated question because we have three dollar signs. <laughs> so let's go from the left. Can I substitute this dollar sign with a dot here? Yes, of course, I can. Can I substitute it here? Yes, I can. Can I substitute this one? No, I cannot, right? Why I cannot? Now, so. Well, actually, actually, I can. I can, but I have to do a trick because just is also a function. So just is a type constructor function, which uses one argument and produces me a value of maybe type. So then I have to do a trick because then I have to do this. That will work.
if I didn't do this dollar, it wouldn't work. Why? Why this doesn't work? Because this thing here, uh, is not a function, is a result of a function, which is a value. And I cannot compose a function with a value. I can only compose a function with a function, right? So just 10 is a value. So then I can, I can pass a value to a function like this, or I can pass a value to a function like this, but I cannot compose function with the value, right? So I can do this, but I cannot do this now because I have this dot here, which means this is not a function. So this dot doesn't work because this is not a function anymore. This is a value, which is a result of running our add on that value, right? So you have to like um, in, in, in C or normal programming languages, that's not a problem because the syntax tells you what is the function and what are the values because the values are always in parentheses as a parameters, right? Uh, here we don't usually use parentheses and the application of a function to another function is a space. And then uh, it, it gets, and you kind of read it from kind of right to left. So you kind of need to parse it in your head. So you, you have to sort of distinguish what is a value and what is a function. So this is a value. Its value is just 30 because we just added 20 to just 10, right? It's a value, it's not a function. Um, this is a function. This is a function which expects one argument. This is a function which expects one argument. This is not a function. This this doesn't expect anything, right? It, it is already a value. So if I cannot do dot, I can pass the pass it like this. Okay, so if I do this and this is a value and I cannot, um, like this will not work neither because as I said, this becomes a value and you read it from like, you're doing this function first, this becomes a value and you, you cannot compose it with the with functions. But what you can do is you can say, I actually stop here. So now this is a function and this is an argument to this function. This function takes one argument, right? And it kind of uh, adds 23 times to that one argument. And now this became the, that argument because I, I differentiated what is a function and what is an argument by this dollar sign. If I don't have this dollar sign, then this thing here is together because applying function to, to something or applying function to function takes precedence. So space has the highest precedence when you combining expressions, right? So you kind of need to read this as if there were parentheses, as if there were parentheses like this. Does that make sense? So to answer your question, when should we do one or the other? Like, should I write my code like this or should I, um, write my, my code like this, uh, I would say every time that you can use dot and you can write code like this, you should write code like this because it's clear that there is one function, which is a composition of those four functions. And there is one argument to that function, which is 10, right? And we often do that, like if, if we want to now map this composed function to a list of something which has numbers, then you, you would do map, you would do this with dots, and then you would have a list of numbers, right? And that, that, that kind of is a clear structure. Whereas if I read this, I, it takes a little bit more mental load to parse like what is going first, what is the argument, what is the value and so on, right? It, it's actually a little bit harder to parse this than to parse this. 
They are the same, but they are kind of, um, it, it's sort of easier to do it this way. So if you can use dot, you should use dot. If you cannot use dot, then you have to use whatever you can, right? Either parentheses or the dollar sign. It gets a bit more, even more complicated. Why? Because let's say we have this. So let's say we did this the nice way and we have something like this, okay? That works. But we can also like uh, flip it around. So what we can do is we can say, I'm doing the just 10 first, and then I want to write it left to right. So then I want to pass it to our ad. And then I want to pass result of that to our ad. So I, I want to read my code from left to right, right? So then we have to put something here, right? What, what can we put here to pass this to this? So one, one operator that we know for composing this way is, um, is bind, but bind will not do it because bind will unwrap this, um, this value and our ad expects a monadic value, right? Our ad is, um, um, did I, yeah, it expects maybe int, not just int, right? So if we were to compose it like this, if we were to compose it like this, which we, um, which we often want, we often want kind of a value and then multiple things to be done on it. Uh, then we would need to rewrite, um, we would have to say our add takes x and x is actually an int, oops, is, this is an int and we returning uh, x plus 10 or uh, 20 in our case, which is a maybe, maybe int. Yeah, we say our at two. And then if we want to do this, then it will work, right? So now we can kind of compose from left to right using the bind operator because our type for our at two takes an int and produces the wrapped context. And we often want that. We often want kind of a pure values to be kind of embedded into the context or on what we're working with. And then we can kind of compose our functions and our code this way. So then my suggestion is, if you can compose your type, if you can declare your types, and if you can prepare them to be able to be done this way for composition, then usually that's better. Usually that creates a, a more modular and better kind of a code structure, right? It is a little bit annoying that, um, there are multiple ways of achieving the same thing in Haskell and you don't quite know which one is better, but that's why we're doing those labs and that's why we're discussing it. It all boils down to readability and it boils down to maintenance and it boils down to the kind of a general structure of your code. Once your code feels kind of a nice and tidy and kind of a nicely composable and your functions are kind of neat, you know you've done a good job. If, you, if your functions have a lot of case, if your functions have a lot of if statements, then you know, yeah, it feels kind of, I can improve it, right? So then you try like, you know, this is very, very nice, right? So if, if I compare this of what this does uh, to our first attempt, which was this, of course, this one is much nicer, right? at least to me, <laughs> maybe it's not obviously nicer to you, but it, it is kind of a uh, cleaner. Uh, we know we have a value, we're doing something with that value. And then with the result of that, we're doing something again, right? 
So he, reading this is, you know, much better than uh, than reading this. Yeah. Anyway, let's. Let's continue doing those things and then you will get more and more intuition, okay? So now I have a task for you. It's a very fun task, uh, which I uh, invite you to, um, uh, to do with other programming languages. So here the task is some function should uh, return uh, hello, yeah, let's, okay, let's rename it to two, some func two, and let's leave it here. I will commit the code such that you have a trace, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some func, which is using if, which is defined by you, by you without using if. So, Write my if. First, uh, tell me my if, what will be the type of my if. And then what we want is my if to work like almost like it's an if expression. So if this thing is true, it should do the first thing and ignore the second one. If this thing is false, it should do the second thing and ignore the first thing. So you're basically defining if in Haskell, for Haskell, in Haskell, without using if, and without using case. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, How could you do that? So first, what is the type? Okay, that's a good start. We want bool to be the first thing. What will be the second thing? How can we be more generic than that? Like, look, if, if I do this, if I say, um, my if, so I would say, let be my if true 10 or 20. We want that to work as well. So what B will be? What type? What, what will be the type of B here? For that statement, what is the type of B? If I do this, what type B has? Maybe. Why maybe? What what's this? This is a polymorphic number. We don't know what type it is actually. So B will be of type with some sort of number, right? So that would be our B. If I say, let B my if true mama tata, what will be B? B will be a string, perfect. So what if I say B, let B equals my if true, put string line mama or put string line data what will be b io action empty action right because this returns empty io action I probably would have to put them in parentheses because to tell the compiler where we stop the expressions. All right, so from this simple use cases, 
B sometimes is a number, sometimes it's a string, sometimes it's IO action. So what, what does that mean? It means that it can be anything, right? Anything and anything. So can we, so this is anything, this is anything, and then it returns something, right? We have to return and we return anything. So here we already see a little bit of a dilemma because what if I said, um, uh, what if I said my if true mama 10, can I do that? Yeah, it's a little bit problematic, right? Why it is problematic? Because now I have a signature which says the type of the first expression is A, the type of the second expression is something else, so it's B, so what should I return? I, I can only return one type, right? I cannot return A or B, I can only return A or B, right? So I have to make the decision, the signature, what that function returns. So, yeah, you kind of need to, uh, you you could, um, you could do something fancy, like for example, you could return a tuple, which has A, B, and then sometimes A is filled in, sometimes B is filled in, right? But that is kind of ugly because then you would need an if statement to check which one is actually there and which one isn't, right? Uh, because one of them will be empty or something kind of uh, indicating emptiness. Um, so that is kind of ugly. So normally we just don't allow that, right? So normally we say, okay, uh, this case is not allowed. The compiler will complain. If I have a function like this and I try to call it like this, the compiler will say, look, 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 you said the type A is a string. So I kind of expect string here as well, right? So the compiler will kind of throw an error here, right? So normally we kind of do it like this. Uh, and normally we say, uh, okay, you have to say strings, right? Or something that return a string. So you could have, uh, you know, something else. Um, something like this, right? Which evaluates to a string. So anyway, um, that is our signature. So it takes a bool and then whatever and whatever, but those two whatevers have to be of the same type. And then it will return the type of those two whatevers, right? So in our case, it's a empty IO action. So the return of some func will be an empty return action which happens to be exactly what our main should return, which is what we're calling in main, right? In main, remember, we're calling some function and we expect to return an uh, empty action, right? So this line will compose nicely with our main. It will return an empty action and it will return either this one or this one, depending what this is. So how we can define it. So how would you define this? We could use guards. We could use guards, but guards will be a little bit less readable. Uh, my implementation is this. I'm taking this and my if false of whatever and a or false close returns false close or true close true, true close okay so we obviously we have some warning about those numbers because the uh, comparison it sort of depends what type those are and it says oh yeah i don't know what you mean here do you mean integers or do you mean something else? So it kind of, uh, you know, uh, defaults to integer, right? So the compiler kind of complains about us being a little bit not specific enough about the literals. Um, and our implementation is as trivial as, as it gets, right? So let's try if it works. 
So if 10 is bigger than 20, we should get this. Otherwise, we should get hello. So what should we get? We should get hello. And that's what we get. We get hello. And it complains about this function not knowing what, you know, uh, what those numbers are. And it defaults to integer. So we can kind of get rid of this error by telling the compiler what we mean. That we mean, oops. We mean an int. And we mean an int. So now let's see if the compiler is more happy. Um, almost happy. We probably need parentheses. That's another annoying thing. Like you never know when you need parentheses or not, but most of the time if you put them and you don't need them, the IDE will tell you, you don't need those parentheses, delete them, right? So IDE will kind of help you to work that out. It knows Haskell better than us. All right, so now if I rerun it, um, there will be no compiler errors or warnings. Uh, there is one error. Okay, so it compiles complains that some func is not used, and it complains that some func uh, doesn't have a type signature. So let's fix those. This one is easy to fix uh, because what is the type signature for um, some func? It is actually just IO because uh, we don't pass this bool. It's built in into the body of the function, right? The, the function actually doesn't take any arguments. So we hard coded the bool here. Um, so if we were to extract it, yes, we would kind of say we passing a bool and then doing those two things. But right now it's just this. And then how do we fix that some func is not used error? We can comment it out or we can say, yeah, maybe, you know, um, some uh, modules with depend on us will use it. Well, let's make it public, publicly exposed to the outside world. And let's say if that makes the compiler happy. And it does. It says, okay, I see, you know, somebody who I don't know about is using it. So I will not complain. So now we have no compiler errors and we have hello and we defined an if statement in Haskell. Can you define an if statement in C? Can you write a function which will work like an if statement in C? And how would you implement it? Yes, so you would have to use if inside that function, right? Can you implement and, and that would work. It, it would be much uglier than, than this one, right? <laughs> uh, it would be similar, okay, not much uglier. It would be similar. You would say, if the bool, then the first argument or, or else the second, okay? But if you were to implement the if statement in C without an if statement inside the body of the your if function, you could use a switch, yes. But if you cannot use a switch, Then it's, I think, hard, <laughs> probably not possible. In Rust, how can you implement it in Rust? Okay, you can use if, okay. You can use case, okay, or switch. What else can you use in Rust? In Rust, they have a match expression as well. And the match expression is kind of equivalent to what we're doing here, right? So in, in in Rust, you could actually implement it the same way we've implemented it in Haskell using a match of the first argument into true and false. So it would be kind of a similarly implementable, right? Um, all right, so that was kind of a fun exercise for uh, implementing an if and thinking how can we do it in C or C++. Um, could you do it in C++ without the if statement using templates? You probably could using the actual conditional template templating. Um, 
Okay, so then I have a couple of more things. Uh, let me see the readme file. So implement the if conditional function. Okay, implement the identity function. So how could you, what, what is an identity function? It's a function which given another function just returns whatever the other function does, right? Can you do it in C? Yes, you can do it in C, but it will be a little bit um, sort of a longish syntax because you have to pass a function to a function. So you have to pass a pointer to a function and then you have to return whatever that pointer is out, right? Um, how do you implement the identity function in, um, in Haskell? So what we're doing in Haskell is there is an identity function, which is called ID. That's exactly what it is. So ID is the identity function, but we want to implement our own, right? So our ID function, what signature our ID function will have? Well, it will say I take anything and return anything. And um, our ID takes a function and returns it. So that that is the implementation of the um, of the identity function in Haskell. In C, it's similar, uh, but you would have to say our. So you'd have to say. Let me see. So you would have to say. What are you returning? You're returning a pointer to a function. Um, I, I don't remember the syntax, to be honest, but you will have to say, I'm returning. A, uh, and also, it's a little bit tricky with types, because in C, you have to say, what is the signature of that function? Like, if the function doesn't take any arguments, or if the function takes one argument, it's actually a different signature, right? And also what it takes, like if my our ID takes a function, you have to say what that function signature is, uh, what it takes as arguments and what it returns. So actually it's a little tricky, uh, tricky in C um, because you have to be precise of what that is. Here, we don't care. Like if F takes one argument or if F takes no arguments or if F takes three arguments, it's, it's very generic. So we can do it kind of using a generic programming and it, it sort of works for any types of functions, right? You get the point? Okay, so uh, that's um, the second thing. The third thing, implement a function that composes two functions, f and g. So we have to write a function which given two functions returns the composition of those two functions, right? Again, in Haskell, it's trivial. Uh, so in Haskell, it's like, um, you would say our compose, uh, it, again, it will have a signature of take something. Um, so you would have to say, give me a function which um, produces um, from A to B and a function which produces from B to C. And I will give you back something which takes A and produces C directly, right? So that's the signature of our function for composition. Uh, and then you would say our compose takes function F and G. And then F is from A to B. So we do F first. And then the G is from B to C. So we do G second, we compose them. And then it will return when you pass, if you pass to this composition, if you pass A, F will eat it and produce B and pass it to G and G will eat it and produce C. So at the end, it will produce like this function composition is from A to C, right? So that will work. Um, 
So this is how you would implement it. Uh, so I identity function, and this one is composition function. Uh, the composition itself in C is not much harder, right? Because what you would do is you would say call G, so you'd have um, you'd have to return return a lambda lambda which takes a single argument of type A, uh, and then you would say F odd um f of that argument so argument and then f would produce what g will consume and g will return it so you have to return um a lambda in c we don't have lambdas so you would have to yeah i don't know how how you do it in c but in c plus plus you could do it in c plus plus you would return a lambda which uh which um takes a or arg and then kind of uh, does this, right? And it takes uh, like the our compose function. So our compose would take two arguments. It would take uh, f and g functions and do something like this. Like it would return, it would return this lambda, right? That's kind of a pseudocode. I, I don't know, I don't remember exactly the C++ syntax, but it would be kind of like this. But it would be kind of much more complex. The point here is that some things which are kind of uh, really trivial in Haskell, uh, like those things like here, become, they, they are not impossible. Like maybe this one is impossible in C, but in C++ it's not impossible. You can do it. It just becomes kind of a lot of boilerplate code uh, because you have to sort of uh, take care of the type safety and so on. You, like you probably can do it in a template uh, using generic programming where the type is not relevant, but even when the type is not relevant, uh, it still is much more code than uh, doing this, right? So let's delete that. All right, so then um, what else do we have here? Uh, implement the function that compose. The same as three, but this time, there is a, we want the composition to work with a, more parameters than two, than one. That is actually very complicated. Like it, it is uh, complicated in Haskell as well uh, to compose two functions which return more than one thing and the other function consumes more than one thing, right? Composing something that returns one single thing it's kind of very easy in Haskell and relatively easy in uh, other programming languages. But if you're returning more than one thing, then it gets kind of uh, hairy, right? So number four looks kind of easy on surface, but it's actually much, much, much harder. Uh, number four will not be in the exam, but the other, other points might be in the exam. All right, so write a function that given two functions executes the first one first, discards the result and executes the second one and returns the, the result of the second one. Okay, we haven't done that in Haskell yet, right? How, how would you do that? Um, so what is the, like, if you are working in a do block, then you say, do this, and then I don't care about the result, and you may don't care about the result by doing this, or even doing nothing. And then uh, you say, do that. And then um, do that function will return something in the context of the monad that you are in, and that will be the return. And the result of this is kind of gone, but this one will be done first, right? So what if we are not like if we, so normally we do this like this. I come on. What if we want to do it in a single line without a do? Then there is an operator, which is called sequencing operator in Haskell. And we do this, do this, sequence, do that. And what this function does, it basically says, okay, I will do the left-hand side first. I will discard the result of whatever that was. 
and then I will do the right hand side afterwards, and then I will return you what the right hand side result is, right? So if we if we go into um, if we go into the GHCI and ask what is the type of the sequencing operator, it says, okay, uh, pass me two robbed values and I will kind of return you the second one, right? So it, it, it is a little bit cryptic because it, um, it doesn't tell you that uh, those two things can be actual functions. It take, t t says there is something in a context and there is something else in the context and I will give you this, the second one, right? The funny thing is that uh, if you ask what is an arrow, what is the function in Haskell, um, a function itself is a monad. So you can pass to a sequencing operator two functions and they will fill in that definition as well because function itself, like applying one thing to another thing is, a, you know, is, a, is M. It's, it, it is a monad in itself, right? So that's why I can say uh, print hello, discard the result and then print uh, world and it will print hello world and it will kind of return the second print IO empty IO action as a result of, of, of running those two things, right? So I can sequence things in Haskell to be done sequentially uh, by doing the, uh, by using that sequence operator. So the task is uh, how can you implement it yourself in um, in Haskell and in other programming languages. Um, so you already know the answer. So our sequence um, it takes uh, a and b and returns b. Or to be kind of a really uh, fancy, you can actually do the M. And then you say our sequence. And you say F and G and you do F first and then you do G. Right, so let's do that. And um, again, in the C or other programming languages, you know, doing one thing, discarding the result and doing another is like a normal situation. So it's very easy. You just call F first and then call G. But defining the actual our sequence function is very complicated. Like you probably cannot do it generically in C. You probably can do it generically in C++ using templates. But in the normal language, expressing this, expressing that I want to pass two functions and I want to do the first one first and the second second, it's actually super hard in C, right? Like impossible. So the exercise is uh, generally um, to, yeah, so in, in, in here we actually, it complains that we need to say monad M, 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 M. Right, so then it will complain that those functions are not used, but at least you will have the stack run. So we have our ID, our compose, and our sequence. So let's do that. Um, So our ID, our compose, and our sequence. Perfect. So I will commit that. Um, All right, so this is, uh, okay, there is a comment in the chat. Let me see. Where is the chat? Here. 
meeting chat there is no comment okay i thought there was a comment any questions so check the readme file um and then uh with, with the exception of number four which is super hard everything else is kind of very easy or should be very easy so if you're not comfortable with that uh try it out uh try to follow the the code and um and we covered that like we covered the conversion from the do statements into the bind uh this will be in the exam as well so you may be given like the very simple hello world thing and you have to use the bind to kind of order it properly right uh so get yourself kind of uh, comfortable with the with the bind uh and uh, simple io functions okay uh so that's it for today uh i am available so those of you who want to check the windows setup or want to work here with me for the windows setup uh yeah we can stay here or we can go to my to my office okay so i will stop yeah see you zoom people